Wow, well, welcome everyone. Thank you guys so much for coming. Um, life really has been beautiful this weekend, hasn't it? Yeah, too bad we're all gonna die. But not, that wasn't a threat, not right now. Just, you know, eventually. Well, that's kind of the reason we're here, isn't it? It sure is, but before we start, I wanna try something. Now, I typically hate when speakers do this at the beginning of a talk, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So, I'm gonna count down from three, and at one, I want you to yell as loud and as proud and as with much conviction as you possibly can muster, I am going to die. All right, ready? Marin, you ready? I'm ready. All right, remember, I am going to die. Here we go. Three, two, one. I am going to die. Wow. That was amazing. <laughs> you are a bunch of morbid sons of bitches, but... Because typically, it's a very awkward thing to say, but... Yeah, wow, we're, we're impressed. Not for you. So I was going to say, okay, so you're probably wondering why Life is Beautiful folks uh, brought two people on stage to talk about death. Well, the gist of that is that death is actually one of the things that makes life beautiful. And we're not saying that death doesn't suck, because it does. You know, one of the most, if not the most challenging things in life is suffering the loss of a loved one. But we're here to talk about our own mortality, our death. Exactly. So I started my journey on kind of doing a deep dive into death about 12 months ago. And it, it all, st well, Memento Mori, first of all, became a religion of sorts. It all started when the company that I founded five years previously had to shut its doors. And this meant that I needed to lay 400 people off overnight. These people were my friends, my family, and the company was everything to me. Um, my co-founders and I had spent the last half a decade building this. So the loss of that dream and the hurt that it caused all people involved was just devastating. And it very much felt like a death. It actually felt like several deaths. The death of our hopes and dreams, the death of a close-knit community that I loved, the death of the relationships that were so near and dear. So fast forward a month after this happens, and I'm standing in a humid, Florida Cemetery with my mother, and we are laying my grandma's ashes to rest. And at one of the lowest points in my life, the realization kind of struck me of, wow, like, this life is temporary. And as I was standing in the graveyard thinking that, it made me realize, okay, so I'm not dead, that means I'm alive. And if I'm alive, I can choose any path I want going forward. So after I realized I was going to die, I started to think about how I was living life. And I realized that the majority of my life was lived in shoulda, woulda, or coulda mode. And this meant that I was always thinking about worrying about planning for the future or regretting and analyzing the past. And it became very clear that shoulda, woulda, and coulda were the sworn enemies to me leading a happy, present life. Thankfully. I came upon the practice of memento mori, and that started to transform my life. And along that journey, I listened to, or stumbled upon a podcast, because my dear mother let me meet this guy. So my path to memento mori was a diff bit different than Marin's. Um, to start, I had no particular interest in the, the death or dying industry. Despite what my mom thinks, I am not obsessed with death. Um, I have suffered loss, the brutal type of loss that really fundamentally changes who you are as a person and how you see the world. But that wasn't what led me to Memento Mori either. The reason was that I was trying to impress a girl. So, <laughs> thank you. So, um, the beginning stages of courting, she had asked me, if you had a podcast, what would it be on? And it was a totally, it was a small talk question, but I have this problem of overthinking things and I took it very, very seriously. If I had a podcast, what would it be on? And so after like the sixth day of stewing on it, I'm sitting at my desk working on a script about this 28 year old dude who was going through an existential crisis. And I look up at 
my wall in front of me and I have all these sticky notes there and I see words on them like angst, dread, meaning. And then to my right, I see a stack of books by the, some existentialist writers like Kierkegaard and Watts and Ellison and Sartre. And it hit me. Like all of my work, all of like the scripts that I write have to do with the search for meaning in one way or the other. And so my answer to her was if I were to have a podcast, it would be on death. And then it was like, oh, I'm doing a podcast on death. And so that's how The Adventures of Memento Mori, A Cynic's Guide for Learning to Live by Remembering to Die, started. The idea was, the purpose was, that if I could reconcile my own mortality, then that would free me to live a more meaningful and enlightened life. So what happened to the girl? Well, she never called me back. But, uh, but I have a podcast. So kind of a fair trade. Okay, so we've said memento mori a few times already, and the question bears, what is memento mori? So at its base, memento mori is a Latin word that means remember you must die. The practice of it originated uh, in ancient Rome. So after a victorious battle, the citizens would throw the winning general this big victory parade. But to keep him humble, to make sure he didn't get delusions of grandeur, they would station a slave behind him. And they would have the slave, the slave say over and over, yo, general dude, remember you're just a man and you're going to die just like the rest of us. But it was in Latin. But yeah. Yeah. Memento Mori as an art firm also came around right after the Black Plague, so, which was one of the worst pandemics in humankind. In the 1300s, it killed about one third of Europe's population in the span of a decade. So. The artists, the sculptors, started to create things that reminded the viewer that death was around the corner, that it spared no one. And memento mori most often is in the form of a skull. So in 1989, there was this film, Dead Poets Society, you may have seen it, in which Robin Williams' character made famous the phrase carpe diem, seize the day. Well, after that film, people began to like carpe dieming the shit out of everything. There were carpe diem salons, tattoos, even carpe diem flavored ice cream. Um, like the world went crazy seizing the day. But what gives that day meaning and why you should be seizing it in the first place is the fact that there are a finite number of them. You, me, everyone we know will die. Remembering that, acknowledging that on a daily basis is what gives carpe diem its meaning, its power. So it should be memento mori carpe diem. Remember you will die, so seize the day. The podcast is my practice of memento mori. And so in the show I interview death subject matter experts so that I um, will have a better understanding of, of death holistically. So thus far on the adventure, I have written my will, I have uh, instructed my mother when to pull the plug, I have planned my own funeral. While participating in a seance, a spirit has told me to man up. Uh, I hopped on the immortality bus and learned about the science of living forever with the transhumanist party's presidential candidate. I've been hypnotized and visited my past lives. I listened to a photojournalist uh, describe how, after being abducted in Iraq, uh, what it was like just to survive second by second. And through an amazing artist, I was moved by the thoughts of nine people who were spending their final days in hospice care. As a result, I actually have learned to appreciate life more. And really to call bullshit on things that just aren't important. However, like my, my practice isn't really scalable and it's pretty unique to me. Marin, on the other hand, being the entrepreneur that she is, has made a hack. So she's developed a four-step process in which you can, anybody, can practice memento mori um, on a daily basis. Yes, yeah, so, so 
The, the daily practice of memento mori is really simple, but like eating well or exercise, if you don't do it on a regular basis, it, it won't have the same effect. So the, the way to start out the, or the way I start out my memento mori ritual is by grounding myself in the present to kind of dissuade from the shoulda, woulda, couldas. So, but yeah, but what is the ritual? Like, and how ceremonious do you make it? How formalized do you make it? So every morning, I put my phone into airplane mode. I find a cafe that's maybe 10 minutes away from where I'm staying, and I do my daily ritual of memento mori. And this starts with grounding in the present through three gratitudes. And the reason it's a gratitude is because when you realize, when you really accept that life's impermanent, it makes it very easy to be grateful for the things that we have right now, what's around us. So my gratitudes will be, you know, being grateful for the weather, thinking of a conversation with a friend the night before and being grateful for that, or simply taking a deep breath and just grounding down and being happy that I'm alive. I actually have a ritual as well. So this pinky ring is actually my physical memento mori. And every morning when I put it on, I acknowledge that this day could be my last day. And I try to keep it as formal and as consistent, but as, as simple as possible. So the second step to the daily practice of memento mori is actually discovering your authentic self, which can sound a little hippy-dippy, but it's, it's very real. So Hollywood kind of uh, aggrandizes the idea of an aha moment where you find out your true self. But in reality, discovering your authentic self is a process. It's peeling back the layers of expectations. It's peeling back external influences to get to the core of who you are. And I actually stumbled upon this uh, recently and was quite surprised because if you would have told me that I wasn't being my authentic self, I would call you a liar. Uh, but I had a non-Hollywood aha moment where I realized not who I was, but who I wasn't. Yeah, on a regular basis, I ask myself, am I, am I in line with my authentic self? Am I living in a way where that is, is aligning with with all the different parts that are important to me. So, even as like a 40 year old, because um, we have so much pressures, right? Even the way like the, the media tells us what to do. Um, and I, I'm often surprised just about how deep seated um, th that pressure is. And so I'd like to share with you my uh, aha moment when it comes to living your authentic self. So a couple months ago, I went to a lecture called The Joker Hamlet and George R.R. R. Martin, uh, Radical Nihilism. It was given by a Professor Jeffrey Clock, and he uses Game of Thrones and The Dark Knight to illustrate how power resides in what we believe in. Um, how power resides in what we believe in. And so that was the trigger that made me have my, my aha moment. And Professor Clock was gracious enough to make a summary video uh, for us to share with you today. In Game of Thrones, Lord Varys tells a story. He says, in a room sit three great men, a king, a priest, and a rich man with his gold. And between them stands a freelance soldier, a guy of common birth and no great mind. And each of the great ones bids him slay the other two. Do it, says the king, for I am your lawful ruler. Do it, says the priest, I command you in the names of the gods. Do it, says the rich man, and all this gold shall be yours. Who lives and who dies, Varys asks. Uh, what makes the story interesting is that even though you think of these guys as being important, it's the guy with the sword that has importance because whatever he believes in determines who's the most powerful person in the room. If he really cares about money more than anything else, then he's going to do what the rich man says. If he really believes his country uh, is the first commander in his life, then he's going to do what the king says. 
Um, and you know this from your day-to-day -day life, right? That if, if uh, you, you have a religious person who says, oh, if you have premarital sex, you know, God will punish you. If you go, I don't believe in God, then that person's leverage is completely gone. Um, similarly, in a hostage situation, right? You got a guy, he's got a gun to a girl's head. You give me the money or the girl gets it. If uh, I don't care about that girl and I shoot her myself, that's the end of the exchange. The hostage taker has no more power. Um, little kids know this, right? When you deal with a little kid and eat your vegetables or you don't get any dessert, if the kid goes, I don't want dessert, uh, then all of a sudden uh, you've lost your leverage over the kid. Uh, Varys says, power resides where men believe it resides. It's the things that you believe in uh, that give them power over you. Whether it's uh, money or God or the law or the sanctity of human life or dessert. Um, Borges, the short story writer, has a great quote about actors that I think is really relevant here. He says that an actor is a person who stands on a stage and pretends to be another person in front of an audience of people who pretend to take him for that person. Right? That, that an actor says, I am Batman. And then the audience has to go, yes, he's Batman. You can't, the movie doesn't work if the audience goes, that's not Batman, that's, that's Christian Bale. I saw him in Newsies. Um, but this goes for structures as well, like the king, right? The king, there's no sort of kingometer we have to sort of test a guy's kingly powers. Uh, a king is a guy who says, I'm the king, and everyone goes, yes, you are. And if the king wakes up one day, and everybody go, and he says, I'm the king, and everyone goes, no, you're not the king. That's, you know, that's, you're a crazy person. Then that's it. He's a crazy person, and he becomes that guy in the subway uh, rambling on about Masters of the Universe or something, and they lock him in an insane asylum. Uh, what makes the Joker from Dark Knight such a sort of attractive, cool character um, is that he's withdrawn all of his investment in all of his power structures. He doesn't care about money. He burns it. He doesn't care about the law. He doesn't care about God. Uh, and what makes that, what makes him such a charismatic villain is that the power that he has is completely accessible to anyone who's willing to withdraw their sort of psychic investment uh, in the structures of power because it's only your investment that gives them that power. It's only your investment that gives them that power. And it was that that triggered myself, or the question that I asked myself is, uh, what do I give my power to? And I, you know, we can ask this and give each other, ourselves honest answers, but I gave myself uh, an honest answer, and it's uh, a little embarrassing, so I asked for a little bit com of compassion before. I share this. So I grew up in Seattle in the early 90s, and the narrative that I tell about that period of my life was that it had to do with, like, the grunge scene, right? But there is a whole other side uh, that was, like, hidden in the crevices of my brain. Uh, and it was I wanted to be a businessman. I worked in the student store. I attended extracurricular business clubs. And the person that I wanted to be like when I grew up was... Donald Trump. And now, uh, there's not a person that I'd probably be, want to be more most unlike. But the reason why I wanted to be like Donald Trump when I was 17 is because he had three things that I wanted. He had money, he had power, and he had fame. I wanted money because I was raised by a single mother and we didn't have any. I wanted power because at the time I weighed a buck 25 soaking wet and I was bullied. I wanted fame because we moved around a lot and I just wanted to be popular. That wasn't who I was, that wasn't the, the core version of me when I was 17, but that is what I gave my power to. And the realization after this lecture was that despite being a quasi-evolved adult, um, who really wants to do significant things in the world, I admitted that I was still giving up my leverage to the want of money, power, and fame. It was still at the root of what I did. Um, and so this is why uh, understanding what you believe in and, and what, who you are authentically is important because I just now am discovering it and I'm just now peeling back the layers to find out who I really am. The great part is once you, you know, once you start to decode and once you start to realize who your authentic self is by peeling back those layers, you're then freed to get to the third step of the daily ritual of memento mori, which is living purposefully. So you have a living 
purposefully, but what is the difference between that and finding your purpose? So, yeah, I know we've talked a little bit about like seeking purpose, finding meaning, but in reality, living purposely is the goal. Uh, seeking your true purpose or your true calling or whatever is a mirage. It's something that's always in front of you and the farther you chase it, the farther it will go versus living purposely, honestly, like what we're doing now, what we've, prepping for this talk, we figured out what Memento Mori meant to each other. We uh, prepared slides and thought about how the audience would react and now we're sharing what we've learned with everyone here. This actually is you living purposely right now. You can't tell me that, because like, seek, searching for meaning is, and purpose is kind of what I do. Yeah. Like yeah. angst is my most charming personality trait. I hate um, to break it to you. So, so you're telling me that I should stop looking for my purpose. Yes, stop seeking your purpose, instead, tie into your authentic self, realize what you believe, and then the, the, the decisions you make in life, whether it's something super simple or you know where you're gonna live or who you're gonna partner with, all of those tie back into your authentic self. And when you make those decisions based on what you believe, you are living purposely. So you're doing it right now. And just to completely shatter your existential angst bubble, this is, tees us up to do the most important step in the daily ritual of Memento Mori, which is being freed to love deeply. Now this one I have the most trouble with because when I see love deeply, I just see a platitude. I see an abstract, word on the wall of a yoga, yoga studio. So explain to me, what does love deeply really mean and like in practical terms? Okay, not that there's anything wrong with yoga studios, but no. so what love deeply really is, is all about is, I'll, I'll drop some facts on you, how about that? So study after study shows that the people that are happiest in life are those that have two things. They have close-knit communities and they have meaningful personal relationships. Now, go from the alternate of that to people that are on their deathbed that are interviewed. The top regrets that they state over and over are, I wish I'd spent more time with my friends and family. I wish I had expressed myself more openly. I wish that I had of let myself be happy. Unonymously, when you think about studies of people who are in the midst of life and people at the end of, at end of their life, money, power, fame don't matter. At the end of it all, all that matters is the loving connections you have and relationships around you. So I, uh, obviously this is my strong suit. Um, I had to have, have what they call a contingent love <laughs> problem. So it's, it's the win-then statement. It's the win X, then Y. So when I reach a certain amount of success, then I will make time for a relationship. When I finish this project, then I will hang out with my friends. And it goes on and on and on. And what happens is, or what happened to me at least, was the wins just get bigger. And then the thens never happen. And the next thing you know, 10 years go by and you're still living on a win-then statement. Exactly, and, and honestly, it's not just unique to you, as much as I know it would be nice to be. Um, it's something that everyone struggles with, that, that sense of loving deeply. So, let's do a recap. Now that we know the daily practice of Mento Mori, is you're experiencing the present through gratitude, you're discovering your authentic self, peeling back those layers, you know the difference between seeking purpose and meaning and living purposely, and now all you have to do is let go of this and focus on this. That leads to loving deeply. Uh, you do know how hard that is, right? I do.
but I believe in you. Thank you, Barry. You're welcome. And thank you, everybody. So, oh, hold it, hold it, hold the roll. So before you leave, uh, one more, uh, one, two, three, I'm gonna die. Ready, here we go. One, two, three, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna die. die. Now go enjoy the last night of the festival and carpe diem some shit. Let's go.